Today we're starting from chapter 77, Al Mursilat. It is one of the early re revelations to the Prophet Muhammad in Mecca when the Muslims were a minority, a small community facing difficulties and persecutions. Like the other chapters, it focuses on the essentials of belief. And there are not too many uh, detailed laws revealed at this time, but gradually Allah revealed more and more practical applications of this message in laws governing every aspect of our life. And when we look at these messages in the early stage of Mecca, we can see that they're especially appropriate to those people who don't know much about the religion of Islam to establish their basic beliefs and then gradually upon those beliefs establish their daily practices a little bit at a time until they can perfectly live the message of Islam in their daily lives. <laughs> In this uh, beautiful chapter of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa is calling to witness or swearing by aspects of His creation which testify to His glory and perfection and His ability and power and are signs to us of the truth of this message. The first verse was revealed to us at a particular time. That it was revealed in, Ma in Mina when the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with Ibn Mas'ud and some of the other companions in the shade of a grotto in Mecca. And at that time, this revelation came to them. And Ibn Mas'ud says that he repeated the words after the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ almost immediately after their revelation. Now, as far as the interpretation, these words of these first seven verses are very difficult to interpret. They're very general and we have guidance and memories from the early generation, from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad about their meaning. But Al-Mursilat means those things which are being sent out from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are two basic ways of interpreting these verses as the winds which are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels which are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But each one of them is sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with blessings for humanity as well as warnings for humanity. As far as the last word, urfa, is translated here as one after another and that is one of the meanings. That the angels come down in succession by the command of Allah and the winds come one after another continually uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second verse, the winds that blow violently. Ibn Jarir, one of the early commentators in the Qur'an, was sure that this verse is referring to the winds, not the angels. That the winds can bring what is good and ma'roof, what is beneficial to humankind, and they can also bring violent storms which are a threat. Then in verse 3, Allah SWT says, those that scatter, and this of course can be interpreted as the rain that scatter, clouds are scattered by the winds, and the rain is scattered by the, the winds. The winds take the clouds to one area. It, it rains there. Nearby, they're still in drought. The other people get rain by Allah's will and commandment. And He also sends the angels to scatter the truth of the revelations of Allah, revealing the scriptures of Allah to the different parts of the world, and uh, sending the prophets to all of mankind, to all the different nations of the world who received these messages. And that will take us to verse 4. Farq is taken from the same word that Furqan, one of the names of the Quran, which means to separate, to separate the truth from the falsehood. So the message of the Quran divide, gives us a, a, a division between who's right, who's on the right path, who's on the wrong path, who's doing good and who's doing evil. And so it's a clear proof against us on the Day of Judgment that we have to base our actions according to the Holy Qur'an. And so the verses are revealed once again by the angels to the prophets and the prophets bring that message to humanity of the difference between right and wrong. Then humanity either choose the right path or the wrong path 
and they are once again separated on the day of judgment some of them are the companions of the right and some of them are the companions of the left verse 5 and the angels that bring the revelations to the mess to the messengers those to whom have been dispatched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to visit the messengers and bring them the revelations and of course the final messenger to mankind is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and the final revelation is the Holy Quran and that leads us to verse 6 to cut off all excuses that when the messenger has come to you you have no excuse before you receive the message from Allah the scripture and the prophet you may have an excuse on the day of judgment oh well I didn't know that what I was doing was haram or forbidden nobody told me but Allah has sent the messengers to cut off our excuses didn't Allah send you warners to warn you about this day they will have to agree yes Allah is swearing by all these things and calling them to witness and what he's swearing to is coming in verse 7 Innama tu'aduna lawaqi' Surely Allah is swearing to the truth of this message that what you are promised this day of judgment must come to pass because if it did not then evil would go unpunished in this world and those who are good and follow Allah's messages and endure great struggles and resist temptation to do evil will have no reward and so these promises must come to pass. فَإِذَا النُّجُومُ طُمِسَتْ when is this going to come to pass? This event, which is indisputable, which must come to pass. When is it going to happen? Allah says, when the stars lose their lights, when they fall out of the heavens, and all the lights of the heavens are extinguished. And in verse 9, وَإِذَا السَّمَاءُ فُرِجَتْ The heavens are cleft asunder, become as doors and gateways, and the heavens collapse and the angels are gathered around on the on what is remaining around the world of the heavens witnessing this day the starling day the mountains are blown away or disappear as if a mirage in some verses of the Quran or become as dust or become as fabrics pieces of of cotton fibers floating in the air the mountains are insignificant and lose their power on that day on that day in verse 11 وَإِذَا الرُّسُلُ أُقِّتَتْ The messengers are gathered to a time appointed that all the messengers whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to mankind will be gathered together and some of them will come and will have it will be the leaders of large groups of people their ummah or their followers will be many some of them will be few or be by themselves because in their lifetime they had few followers or none and the Prophet وسلم, will come at the head of the largest group, the largest community of people who believed in him and followed him in this world until the end, until the end of the world. He will have the greatest number of followers. Each of those prophets will be, even though they are the most noble among humanity, will be trembling also and anxious. And they will be uh, hesitant to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and speak out in intercession on behalf of everyone but the Prophet ﷺ will be the one chosen for that intercession and go and prostrate before Allah subhanahu wa and speak and be given the permission to speak on behalf of all of us on the day of judgment that is a day in verse 12 for what day are these signs postponed everybody's saying you know when is this day going to come and of course the Prophet didn't reveal to us the exact time of the hour or the last day there's no wisdom in that because the believer acts as if the last day would be the day, the last day in which you can act, the day that you can do good or evil on this world, the last day of your life. While the disbelievers reject it and they believe it's far off and they're not worried about it, they're hoping vainly that they can repent to Allah before the coming of that last day. So they wait until it's too late, till the angel of death appears before them. So which day has been postponed by the wisdom of Allah? <laughs> it's the day of sorting out when there are two groups of people the righteous the believers who have submitted to Allah and those who have rejected Allah and been ungrateful to him and have rejected his commandments that is the day which all of mankind is 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 waiting in verse 14 nothing can explain it to you because 
there is nothing in our experience to prepare us for these tremendous visions of the Day of Judgment. But Allah will give us some examples and some description of what we can expect on that day. Verse 15 that is repeated as a refrain frequently in these chapters. So Allah is saying in clear Arabic language to the unbelievers, which they understood clearly, that doom and destruction await those people who reject the belief in life after death, the belief in the resurrection out of the grave, and the judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alam nuhlikil To us, has not Allah destroyed the ancients? Uh, and can we not also destroy those who have come after them? Woe to those who reject this message of the Holy Quran. And if therefore that is true, and of course it is without doubt that it is true, then are you any different than those people of the past? Is there anything that you can do to protect yourself? Anything that you could do to, to uh, withstand Allah's punishment if it were decreed for you? And of course the answer is no. And so destruction is the destiny of those who are wrongdoers or the translation said criminals. That means those who reject Allah and, and work wickedness and evil here on this earth. And so Allah says, Woe and doom upon those people who deny the Holy Quran. Then he asks us about our origin. And this is a theme that has been repeated in this section of the Quran in many different verses. So it's obviously very important for us to think about the origins and the creation of the human being in various stages. So in verse 20, did we not create you from worthless, despised water, a liquid which is discharged from your parents, from the father and from the mother, which is something disgusting that nobody would like to handle or touch, but from this is our origin. Therefore, how can we deny our creator? How can we reject him and not worship him? In verse 21, and then this water was placed in a place of security, a secure place. And so Allah SWT designed the womb of the mother to be a safe place for the gestation of the fetus until it developed into a, full, a fully developed human child. And so a place of security protected in layers of protection. So we imagine that we are so great and powerful and yet Allah can protect this perfectly helpless infant within the womb of the mother in a way that we are not even able to do for ourselves. It receives all of its nourishment, everything it needs <laughs> for a known period. This term is known as the customary period, which is approximately nine months, but sometimes it's less and sometimes it's more. Children are born prematurely and sometimes they take a little bit longer time. And that period is known to Allah while the period that we know is the customary nine-month period that is, of course, universal for all play, people in all places. In verse 23, So we did measure and we are the best of measurers. That period is known by Allah SWT and He decrees the measurement of their lifespan. While the child is still in the womb, the angel is sent and writes down the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the lifespan of that individual, if they're going to be successful in this life and in the hereafter, and how wealthy or how poor they're going to be. All that is known to Allah and is decreed and is recorded by the angels. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who best measures this. So Allah repeats, woe to them, destruction and doom upon those people who deny they will be held accountable for their actions on this earth. So in contrast, Allah said in verse 20 that He had put this despised water, this insignificant fluid, into a safe place for the gestation of the child. Now in verse 25, Allah is saying the human being in general was placed in the earth as a safe, strong receptacle for the human being Everything that we need is provided us here on the earth and it keeps us safe. The atmosphere protects us 
from the dangerous radiation of outer space and everything that is provided for us, fresh and sweet water. Even people in the desert, the people in Mecca had fresh sweet water coming to them from springs by Allah's power. <laughs> Even the dead are kept, sa are kept safely within the sphere of the earth. They're buried below while the human beings who are alive are on the surface. And so as the ancient Arabic poetry says, we can't walk proudly on the earth boasting because we're stepping on the dust of our ancestors, on the dust of our fathers. So we should be humble walking on this earth. And have placed therein firm and tall mountains and have given you drink, sweet water. So Allah repeats, woe to them, destruction and doom upon those people who deny. They will be held accountable for their actions on this earth. So Allah SWT is telling us, what can those disbelievers who reject the Qur'an, who deny the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. What will be said to them on the Day of Judgment? You see its reality, then you are cast into that which you have denied. That is the fitting conclusion of those who have rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> that is a place where there is a shadow ascending of smoke in three columns. The shade is what is coming from the horrible smoke that is coming from this horrible huge columns of fire. This shade is neither of any use. It's not cool. It doesn't protect you from the heat, but it is simply one aspect of the fierce uh, heat coming from the fire. There's the flame and there's the smoke. Is the smoke probably hotter than the fire itself? In verse 32, Allah says, that the sparks from it are as huge as a fortress. In verse 33, the yellow camels in Arabia were black camels that part of their, 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 their hair is, is turning toward yellow color and it's partly black and that's what they used to call the black camels. All just explaining th what the sparks coming out of this fire are. So Allah says once again in verse 34, Woe to them, uh, destruction and doom upon them because they have denied the day of resurrection and now that day has come and it's too late for them to believe in it because now it is appearing before you. Verse 35. Allah is saying, on that day, on the day of judgment, when the human beings are gathered before Allah, no one is allowed to speak except for those who have been permitted by the All-Merciful to speak. Those messengers who are given permission will speak and intercede on behalf of their followers, the believers who have followed their message and believed in it. And in verse 36, They will not be permitted to bring any excuses or to fight or deny. Even when they are brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are presented with their book of their evil deeds, they will not be able to deny them. They may put up an excuse, but they cannot say this did not happen. But they may be able to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, I had a reason and try to think of a reason to excuse themselves. But in the end, they will be forced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to admit by the truth of their deeds, which they will see. Their own body parts will bear witness against them, their hands, their eyes, their ears, their feet. The whole earth will bear witness against them and they cannot deny. And so Allah says to them once again, Woe upon you, doom and destruction upon you because you have denied this day and here this day is before you and now you cannot speak, you cannot bring any excuse to excuse your actions before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in verse 38, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that is the day of decision. When the decision is made, 
nobody can act, nobody can speak and bring any excuse. The decree of Allah is final and there is nobody who can escape from Allah's judgment. On that day you will be gathered together with the people of all the generations of this earth. So you will never be able to say that it's somebody else's fault, it's the previous people who have misled me, but they will be there each one as a witness against you. So even if people of the past had false teachings and they spread false teachings and, and misled you, yet they will witness that I didn't force him to follow me, but he chose to follow me and I misled him uh, and I'm going to go to hell and he has to go to hell too. And so those people who were misled will say, oh, the people who have misled us deserve double the punishment. But that will not be any good for them and it will be of no satisfaction to them, will be full of regret and wish that they had changed and could go back to the earth and live their lives over again, the right life. And so in these verses Allah is saying, if you have a plot or a plan in verse 39, then come ahead, go ahead, use it against me. The people who died before, they're here, everybody's together with all of our ancestors up until Adam, they're all together and yet Allah allowed you plenty of time to live a long life and yet you still led your whole life vainly hoping that you could repent uh, when death came to you or when the day of judgment appeared. Woe upon you, doom and destruction upon you because you have denied this day and here this day is before you and now you cannot speak, you cannot bring any excuse to excuse your actions before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Allah in contrast gives us in verse 41 the reward of the pious person who shall be amidst shades and springs. The pious here, the word for that is al-muttaqun. Taqwa means seeking to protect yourself, is to obey him, to submit to him, and to follow all of his commandments. And so the pious, the people of taqwa, are protected from the hellfire. They have nothing to fear. They will have no grief. They will never regret the past because the past is forgiven. And they will have no fear or anxiety of the future because they know what they are commanded by their Lord. And they know how to fulfill that with Allah's will. And so Allah said, that There they will have fruits such as they desire. That everything they desire is available to them, the most delicious fruits. The fruits of this world will be available to us in, in, in Jannah. They will have the same names, but they will be something much more delicious and much different than the thing that we're used to in this earth. But if paradise were something totally strange to us, it would be unfamiliar and people would be frightened, they wouldn't feel comfortable. But actually when you go there, you will see everything that will bring comfort to your eyes and to your heart and you will be satisfied. Eat and drink comfortably for that which you used to do. So whatever made you comfortable in this life, you will have it and better than it in the hereafter. And so they think that, why is the Quran so primitive? It has people eating and drinking. You don't need to eat, you don't need to drink, you don't need to have women, you don't need to have gardens. It's all just a philosophical concept like spirits or ghosts floating around the place. But no, that's not what would make somebody comfortable. But the reality is that human beings were created by Allah to enjoy certain physical pleasures. And, and paradise is something more real than the physical pleasures which we enjoy in this world in a way that we cannot understand, but it is a reality. <laughs> that is how we reward the good doers or muhsineen, those people who have ihsan. And ihsan means doing good, doing what is beautiful and good, doing good toward Allah's servants and doing good toward Allah Himself. The ihsan for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to devote ourselves in worship alone to Him as if at all times we could see Him before us because surely He can see us at all times. And the ihsan to people is to treat everybody as we love to be treated. To treat the believers especially with the highest standards of behavior. But also people who reject to be kind to them, to give them their human rights, their rights given to them by Islam, not to curse them, but to respect the rights of every one of Allah's creatures, even to be kind to the animals. Those people who ignore Allah's message, 
who do not believe in the day of judgment are once again in verse 45 told woe doom and destruction upon you because you deny the day of resurrection <laughs> Now he talks about those people who are the wrongdoers. In verse 46, O oh, you who disbelieve, who rejected this message of the Qur'an, eat and enjoy yourselves in this worldly life for a little while. Verily you are the mujrimun or the criminals, those people who are wrongdoers who have violated Allah's commandments and rejected Him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this is a short time you need to make your decision now where you're going to be. If you reject this message, then go ahead, eat and drink and enjoy yourself. Woe, doom and destruction upon you because you deny the day of resurrection. To bow down yourself along with those who bow, they refuse. In other words, join in prayer with the Muslims in bowing down, showing your submission and humble obedience to Allah Ta'ala, but they were too arrogant to do so, to join the jama'ah or the congregation. They said, why should I, a rich, noble person, or I'm more intelligent or I'm better than those people, why should I join them? Maybe my race is better or my class is better. Why should I join them in worshiping? I don't want to join in the religion of those, those people whom I despise who are worshiping Allah Ta'ala. Woe, doom and destruction upon you because you deny the day of resurrection. In the last verse, verse 50, Allah says, Then after this statement, after this Qur'an, what then will you believe? If you cannot believe the Qur'an, you can't believe anything. The Bible, the scriptures of other religions, all of them contain some elements of the truth that have been derived over the generations from Allah's sending prophets and messengers. But the Quran is a unique book that contains the arguments and proofs establishing the reality of Allah, establishing His oneness, establishing that only He deserves our worship and that He has the power to bring us back to life after our death and hold us to account. If you can't believe in the Quran, you won't be able to believe in anything. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi